Good evening. So last week we um, looked at the presentation on the four immeasurables, or we finished looking at the presentation on that, looking at the latitude, the immeasurable compassion and immeasurable joy. And it was mentioned last week that the mark of having generated actual compassion is when the object is for all sentient beings and the wish is for all sentient beings without exception to experience, to be freed from, from suffering and to, to be completely liberated from suffering. And moreover, or secondly, when this wish arises within oneself in a way that is uncontrived. In other words, it doesn't need to be intentionally generated, but spontaneously and naturally arises within oneself. And then we looked at um, immeasurable joy, which is taking uh, delight in um, the, the good that others have, the happiness that others have in, in their lives. And we looked at how to cultivate these minds. So we in the context of culture, uh, first we looked at the preliminary practices, preliminary to, uh, practices to meditation, then the meditation on refuge, and then um, the four immeasurables. And now we come to the meditation on bodhicitta itself. <coughs> Simdunga <laughs> So we really, where we are in, in the text is the same paragraph we've been at for maybe a month, where it says um, on page seven, conjoin your mind with the motivation of thorough trust in the three jewels and generate bodhicitta, and that's where we are tonight, through the refuge prayer and meditating on the four immeasurables. So then bodhicitta, this comes about first through having developed with an object of all sentient beings without exception that may they experience only happiness. And this is the wish for them to experience only happiness is a mind of love. And th this is accompanied by the wish for all beings to be freed of suffering, the mind of compassion. And then when these are developed further to the point where one takes responsibility for the welfare of others, where one takes it as one's own individual responsibility, that this aspiration of, of, of one's, oneself is realized. In other words, it's one, one takes it as one's own responsibility that each being without exception experiences only lasting happiness, never interrupted by even a moment of suffering. When one then takes that as one's own 
commit, uh, commitment and responsibility, then one uh, generates the, the mind, which is uh, of special intention, or the, the altruistic attitude of universal responsibility. This then is followed by, by the thought, now that I've taken this as my responsibility, how am I going to make this possible? Because in reality, I don't have the ability to do that. So who does have that ability? It's only a Buddha, a being who has perfected all good qualities and completely eliminated all faults, a being who has attained omniscient consciousness, arisen in the enlightened state. Only such being, such a being, can guide each and every being in a faultless manner in accordance with their own specific personalities and guide them in the cultivation of the understanding in, in what um, negative behavior to abandon and what is the virtuous be behavior to adopt as well as then guide them in the technique for doing so. So it's only a Buddha, a, this perfect being, has the ability to guide beings to a state freed of suffering, a state of lasting happiness, I commit to strive single-pointedly to become a Buddha for the sake of others. And at this point, guided by these two aspirations of striving to achieve enlightenment for the sake of others, and, 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 and for in order, sorry, striving for enlightenment is the first, for the sake of others, the second, for the benefit of others, the second, when those two aspirations have arisen in, in one's mind, bodhicitta has arisen. So for bodhicitta then arises from the minds of uncontrived love, uncontrived bodhicitta, and then taking responsibility for uh, in, uh, fulfilling this aspiration that one has made, this mind of al the altruistic attitude of universal responsibility. So these three minds are what are required to give rise to bodhicitta. And for bodhicitta to be, um, the bodhicitta that has arisen in the practitioner's mind to be considered actual bodhicitta, that bodhicitta then needs to be uncontrived. In other words, it needs to arise, arise spontaneously without needing to be intentionally generated. Can I just read now from the, the uh, text? Um, Generate bodhicitta through the refuge prayer. And the refuge prayer then is the one that we're familiar with. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and the other perfections, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. The first two lines, I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. So these lines serve as the basis for the generation of the mind of refuge. So here where we see the term Buddha, this refers to the Buddha jewel, the refuge jewel. Dharma, the, the refuge uh, Dharma jewel. And then Supreme Assembly, the refuge Sangha jewel. So these first two lines in the, uh, this refuge prayer refer specifically to refuge itself. Thank 
uscire dai denti, quindi da tempo di là, non è sangue, è sicuro, sangue con ciò, è sicuro. Il Buddha Jul then refers to the, a being that has completely abandoned all faults, even the slightest or the subtlest of faults have been completely eliminated. And moreover, they've perfected all good qualities. And all good qualities in the, um, uh, the complete array of good qualities have been developed to their fullest extent, to the perfected extent. Such a being, possessing the four bodies of a Buddha, so the two form bodies of the um, emanation body and enjoyment body, and the two uh, wisdom bodies, these have been accumulated, uh, these are, are possessed by a being that is a Buddha, And that is the, the refuge jewel of the Buddha. <laughs> Sangsiatiro, The Tibetan word for Buddha is uh, Sangye, so it uh, consists of these um, the two syllables, Sang and Ge. So the first one, Sang, this means uh, to awake or arise, like we do every morning when we wake up or we arise in the morning. So this is the, the uh, meaning of the first syllable, sang, and it refers to all the faults, the afflicted minds, together with their seeds and their, their stains, they're completely eliminated, not leaving a trace behind. So this complete purification is the meaning of the first syllable, sang. And the second syllable, ge, this can be likened to a, 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 a flower blossom that blooming and, and is awakened so that it's at, at its fullest, broadest expanse. And this then is, um, is, is likened then to the, the perfection of all good qualities, the complete development of all good qualities that lead to the omniscient state. So this then is the meaning of the second syllable, that of ge. Mm -hmm. Da The Buddha jewel, uh, that, so that was the Buddha jewel, then the Dharma jewel. So this then refers to the uh, paths that one ha uh, that a practitioner has cultivated in their own continuum the parts of the Dharma that they've cultivated in their own continu continuum, and in particular, the Arya paths, the paths of, of noble beings. So these are what are referred to as the true paths. And these are what lead to true cessations, 
which are the, the uh, individual cessations that lead, that are the abandonment or the varying levels of, the, of subtlety of the afflicted minds. So there are many levels of, of cessation in that there are many levels of subtlety of the afflicted minds that need to be eliminated. And these are, would be included in the um, acquired afflictions and the innate afflictions. And it's the abandonment of these uh, various degrees of, su of subtlety of the afflicted minds together with their seeds and later their stains that um, come about due, due to the cultivation of true paths that lead to the, the cessation of suffering, these true cessations. This is what leads to our liberation from suffering. So when you talk about refuge and the refuge jewels, the actual refuge is the, the mind of the Buddha Dharma cultivated within one's own continuum. That is the actual refuge. The Buddha, the, the Buddha or the Buddha jewel is the, um, the, the teacher of the, the Dharma, but the actual refuge, or to translate this word refuge differently, the actual protection is the cultivation of the minds of the Dharma within ourselves. So when we go for refuge, it's with refuge to the minds of the Buddha Dharma that have been cultivated, that will be cultivated within ourselves, in particular, these Arya paths that come about through training in the Buddha Dharma. the third jewel, the Sangha jewel, this then refers to um, Arya beings or noble beings, superior beings, and they are beings who have the true paths within their continuum. So we don't have the, the, um, the, the ability to meet um, the, the Buddha himself and receive guidance and training from him in person. So therefore, we uh, rely on the help and the assistance and the guidance of the, the Arya beings, the Arya jewel. These beings who, have who are developing the minds of the Buddha Dharma within their continuum and who have given rise to true paths and cessations within their continuum. And they serve as our companions, our helpers, our, our assistants in our own spiritual development. So this is the meaning of the third jewel, the Sangha jewel. Chizan 
Membership to illustrate this um, relationship with the, between, with the three, uh, between the three jewels, there's a, a, a famous illustration where, where the Buddha is likened to a skilled doctor. So when we are experiencing uh, pain and difficulty, we tend to go to someone who's, who's renowned and can and guide us in this state of, or help us in the state of difficulty. And so they return towards the Buddha. And the way that uh, the Buddha helps is that he would uh, 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 pr present the Buddha Dharma, the technique to be freed from suffering and difficulty. So this then in the um, in illustration, the skilled doctor would, would um, having examined the patient, would then prescribe medical treatment. And the medical treatment for the, the suffering patient is, in, in our illustration, is the Buddha Dharma. What uh, minds to, to adopt, what minds to abandon, and how to do so. Then, when having received a prescription from our doctor, we always are faced with a, a choice. Do I accept this or not? Do I follow this advice or not? If we don't follow the advice, any potential benefit that would come from the, the, the doctor's examination and uh, prescription is not going to follow. Similarly, if we decide we accept the advice and we uh, follow it partially, then some partial uh, benefit will come, but not the full benefit. To ensure that the full benefit is achieved, we often need assistance. So with the medical illustration, let's say when it's um, uh, incapacitated or needs skilled assistance. So here one would rely on nurses and other medical professionals to ensure that we take the right dosage of medication at the right um, uh, times of day, etc. So liking, liking to the uh, nurses who assist the, the, uh, the doctors in the application of the medicine, this is the role of the Sangha jewel, the Arya beings, our helpers and assistants on, on the path, those who um, help, uh, guide us in our practice, who assist us in our practice. So this is the, um, the, how the, 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 uh, one can come to understand very clearly the relationship between the, the, ourselves and the th individual three jewels. Mm -hmm. Tasa so that was the explanation of what in English is the second line. The first line, I go for refuge until I'm enlightened. So here one is making the commitment that until one oneself attains the state of enlightenment, the omniscient state of a Buddha, one will not turn for protection or for refuge to any um, other object of refuge other than the three jewels. So it's making a commitment until one oneself achieves enlightenment to only go to refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Sanjusan 
但是人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家人家
so that we too can become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings so as to become the most skilled of guides who lead them to the state of enlightenment. So if you think of um, the, the explanation that we've had um, in the last uh, couple of weeks when you're looking at the minds of love and compassion, then when one has generated the minds of love and compassion, and especially then when one has uh, developed the altruistic attitude of universal responsibility where we commit to, to uh, become a Buddha for the sake of others, so that we can become the most skilled of guides ensuring that all beings achieve the, a state um, of lasting happiness, which is the, the, the aspiration from love, and as well as achieving a state completely separated from, from suffering, which is the aspiration of compassion. Here we now commit to going for refuge until enlightenment is achieved, until enlightenment for the sake of others is achieved. So that is the sequence between um, the aspiration expressed in the first two lines and the, the aspiration expressed in the second two lines. so in our third line, by my practice of giving other perfections in this word, my, so this then refers to oneself, and it can serve as a reminder that we are making this commitment to become a Buddha for others. So that this, um, and this is good to remind oneself because we're reciting this verse in, as in a personal capacity or a, a capacity relevant directly to ourselves. I myself am making this commitment to strive for Buddha, for, to become a Buddha for the sake of others. And in order to become a Buddha, and now we continue, one has to develop bodhicitta. Without the mind of bodhicitta, Buddhahood is not possible. So therefore, we're engaging now in the second part of this verse, where we the cultivation of bodhicitta. And then it continues with what are the um, activities that a bodhisattva get, go, engages in? What is the work or the main um, uh, function of a bodhisattva? This is to train and, and act under the uh, uh, train and act under the inf influence of the minds of the six perfections. So here we're we committing to, um, by my practice of giving and the other perfections, to train our minds in the um, uh, wish to give, the, the mind of generosity, train our minds in the mind uh, of ethical conduct, train our minds in, with the mind of patience, the mind of choice, perseverance, of concentration, and the perfection of wisdom. Because it's these six perfections that are the main activity, the primary activity of bodhisattvas. Narangasan <laughs> Furthermore, 
when in the fourth line they may become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings or all migrators. So here we have now gone for refuge and we have made clear to ourselves that we have gone for refuge in order to become a Buddha for the sake of others. And therefore, we have to generate bodhicitta and then engage in the actions of a bodhisattva, the cultivation of the minds of the six perfections. And we are doing this, as the last line reminds us, for the sake, not just of ourselves, but of all my creators, all sentient beings, without exception. So the verse then ends with this, a, a, re, a restatement of the purpose of the objects of, for whom we are striving, and that is for the welfare of all beings. Dagi <laughs> Um, text in the third line we have here uh, Bana practice of giving and other perfections uh, some texts uh, uh, say something more along the lines of through my um, accumulations so there are these two versions of this um, refuge and bodhicitta prayer and really they're saying the same thing they're just choosing to emphasize one um, aspect or another so the uh, one that we are more familiar with is where it mentions generosity and the other perfections and that's as per the explanation I've already given <coughs> if you see elsewhere where this refuge uh, prayer refers to the accumulations. Then this is referring to the accumulation of merit, which comes through uh, the perfections of, 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 of giving and ethics and patience, and then um, the accumulation of wisdom, which comes about through the uh, development or the perfection of wisdom on the basis of concentration. So there are two different, different versions of this, of this prayer, but the, the meaning to both of them is the same. Mm. <laughs> Denigi <laughs> And just to summarize this, this verse, because it's important to have the meaning very clear to oneself in that one tends to recite this verse um, every day in, what, in your, your own practices. So if the meaning's clear, then um, your mental engagement will be quite different. It won't just be a mere recitation, but one will be um, in, mentally engaging with, with the meaning behind the words. So the first two lines, these refer to the cultivation of going, uh, of going for refuge. And the, the second uh, set of two lines, these refer to the generation of bodhicitta. In bodhicitta, as we've heard, this is generated in dependence first on cultivating love, cultivating compassion, and developing both of these to the, the extent where one takes responsibility for the fulfillment of the, the aspirations expressed by love and compassion where one here generates the altruistic attitude of universal responsibility. So that's the third comp component, and that then leads to the final step of the generation of bodhicitta, which is the cultivation of two aspirations. 
the aspiration to accomplish the welfare of others, firstly, and then secondly, th the aspiration to do so through achieving enlightenment for others. And it's when these two aspirations then are, are cultivated, then bodhicitta is generated. So this is the sequence. Love and compassion, or compassion and love, then um, the altruistic attitude of, special, uh, of, of universal responsibility, and then the two aspirations of striving to become a Buddha for the sake of others. Then th that's the sequence to the arisal of bodhicitta. So we, we may, in our meditation, go through this process and it may also be sincere and our mind does, does shift and a sincere and a genuine wish to become a Buddha for the sake of others may well arise. But that doesn't mean we can say we have now cultivated bodhicitta in ourselves, within ourselves. We can say we cultivate a mind of that type or of similar to that. But when it is actual bodhicitta, that is when it arises within us in an uncontrived manner. We don't need to specifically generate it in bodhicitta, it is, in meditation. It is always present in that it naturally arises within us in an uncontrived way. Nevertheless, through training, using the basis or the seeds that we already have of love and compassion and strengthening these minds and accumulating virtue and purifying negativities, we will develop these minds that we already have present within us, making them ever stronger as we increase our familiarity, our habituation to these minds. And then we will give rise to contrived bodhicitta or artificial bodhicitta. And then through continuing this familiarity, we will give rise to actual bodhicitta itself. <coughs> That就是說什麼大麻花些,你給什麼的人心難給,怕,什麼他們就三個把頭了,什麼什麼的人難給吧,給你的這個給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給給
And how to do so? How to train one's mind so that bodhicitta arises in this uncontrived manner? So there are two techniques. There's the technique taught by Shantideva, that of equalizing and exchanging self with others. And there's the, the technique of uh, Salingpa and Letitia, which is the six causes and one effect method. <coughs> Kamrodi Chiza, to generate then um, cultivate body treater in within oneself the uh, meditation starts with what we um, mentioned earlier this evening and looked at in some detail a few weeks ago which is turning for, uh, for refuge or for protection to the three jewels with certainty within oneself that it's only the, the three jewels, in particular the cultivation of the, the minds of the Buddha Dharma within oneself that can lead to protection from suffering. There is no other method or technique other than going for refuge to the three jewels. In other words, there is no other solution to suffering than cultivating the mind of the Buddha Dharma within oneself. So this is the starting point, going for refuge and doing so with the commitment of, of going for refuge until enlightenment itself is achieved. So that, in, in brief, is the first step of the meditation, going for refuge. The second, then, is to reflect on the, on how, uh, on the sufferings of samsara and to come to see vividly for oneself how suffering pervades our samsaric experiences. And we need to do so to, until the strong wish arises within us uh, the strong almost fear of the suffering so the wish therefore to be liberated from suffering to be freed from suffering arises and this the strength of mind then will lead us to think so where does the suffering come from what are the causes of our suffering and there one will think about the contaminated karma that is accumulated under the influence of our afflicted minds in particular the root cause ignorance of self-grasping and this then strengthens this wish to definitely emerge from the sufferings of cyclic existence, to renounce the sufferings of samsara. So the, the cultivation of this mind of definite emergence, this is then the second step of the meditation. Then the third step of the meditation starts with this understanding that one has relate, uh, uh, cultivated in relation to one's own experiences. So one has come to vividly see for oneself one's own suffering experiences. One then relates it to others. We've now come to an understanding of samsara. We now s relate this to others, seeing how other ordinary beings, beings just like ourselves, are trapped in the same suffering position for the same reasons and sharing the same hopes and desires for, for freedom as we do. 
Tangbo Tangbobi Sedele So I want to emphasize the importance of r- meditating on suffering, in particular in relation to oneself, so a f- a, a meditation in the first person. Because where we can see the importance of this in our everyday life is if we meet someone who's experiencing tremendous uh, difficulties and suffering and problems, and we have no experience of what, they are, uh, of what um, has befallen them, some degree of empathy and compassion will arise for that for them, but it will be weak, and it certainly won't have a, a, a lasting impact on, on, on our way of thinking. But if we have previously suffered in the same way that this person is now suffering, then due to our experience, our knowledge of our own experience, powerful empathy and compassion for this person will arise. A strong understanding of their experience and a strong wish for them to be freed of that will arise within us naturally. (coughs) So in the same way, if we meditate effectively on how we experience suffering, not just core suffering, but the various degrees of subtlety, that um, uh, subtle ways in which we experience suffering, then based on our own experience, and based on our own wish to be liberated from even the subtlest levels of suffering, then later it will be much easier to give rise to compassion and love for others. So therefore it can be said that in order to generate love and compassion, one needs to first start with oneself, in particular coming to understand our our, our suffering experiences, the subtle levels of how we experience suffering. Thereafter, when we come to understand how suffering pervades us, we will give rise to this wish to be freed of suffering. And that in itself will lead to a change in our behavior. In that, wanting to be freed of, of cyclic existence, we will strive to do so as quickly as possible. And if it can come about, if we can achieve it in this life, all the better. But if not, we will know we need to continue to receive good rebirths in our future lives so we can continue our spiritual development. And therefore, we will naturally want to live an ethical life. We will not want to create the causes from suffering, the causes for suffering, because we will be committed to attaining liberation from suffering. So we will naturally turn towards ethics. We will naturally turn away from bringing any harm to others. Moreover, 
we wanting good conditions in our future rebirth so that our Dharma practice goes well, then that practice of generosity will come about very easily for us. So too will the practices of patience, joyous perseverance, and prayer. All the causes that are required in order to ensure that we continue to receive good rebirths. Uh, the meditation then has gone through three uh, three stages first uh, that of refuge second that of definite emergence and then third we relate this experience of um, of, of suffering to that of others and this then is, is where we start in this third step, the cultivation of bodhicitta itself. So how to do so? Well, then in this third step, be, we'll go through some of the subsets, the sub-steps. Um, so these are similar to what we looked at in the last couple of weeks. The first, the first step is developing the mind of impartiality or equanimity, and we looked at that in detail two weeks ago. Here, we first think about how there is no being that we can really say is um, that we, we should be closer to or more distant from because of the uh, variety of relationships that we have had with beings over a variety of lives, over the vast expanse of lives. So the first thing to over, so what we're trying to overcome with this mind of impartiality is to overcome this mind where we are more attached to some and we are um, indifferent to many, and we are averse to, to others. So here we're starting to see others as equal. And they're equal in terms of the relationships we've had with them over uh, beginningless lifetimes. There are certainly many beings in this life we have no relationship with at all. But that's only the case in this one life. Because over the vast expanse of time, there's not a single being with whom we haven't had the relationship of parent and child, where they have been our mother, where they have also been our father, where we have been their parent. So there's this vast entwinement of relationships we share with all beings. So whilst we have a mother of this life and a father of this life, so too have, each, we, ha so too have we had such a relationship with each and every sentient being. And secondly, the, the kindness that some beings have shown us in this life, we can easily point and say, these beings, this group of beings, have been particularly kind to me in this life. But we cannot say that there are these beings who have been less kind to me. Because for the same reason, this vast variety of relationships that we've had since beginningless lives. So this is how we cultivate the mind of impartiality or equanimity. And that then leads into the second step of seeing how we have this relationship of, of um, a mother in this life, mother and child, and this is a relationship shared with all beings. So here we're developing this relationship of, or this feeling of intimacy, of closeness with all beings, no longer feeling close to some and distant from others, but rather close to all beings.
ပင်ပင်မစီကဒီကြောင်းဝါနာရှင်ချာစံကဒီနေကြောင်းရော်ရဲ့စဉ်းစဉ်းဒီနေကြာချာချိကမိုင်းပါချာပါတို့မြတ
when we become vividly aware of the kindness that all beings have shown us, naturally the wish to repay that kindness will arise. Anything else would be deemed inappropriate and, and, and inappropriate. So that then arises in dependence on the strength of the prior minds that have been cultivated. now, recollecting that we have this precious human rebirth, this life that's marked with the freedoms and opportunities, a life of incredible worth and value. Now, Having achieved this, we must use it in the most meaningful of ways to repay the kindness that all beings have shown us. And how to do so? What is it that beings want more than anything? All beings have the same wishes as us. Their innermost yearning is to be freed of problems and difficulties and experience lasting happiness. Here we use this then as an impetus to develop the mind of love develop the wish, may all beings experience only happiness. May all their temporary wishes be fulfilled in accordance with their dharma. May they have sufficient, nutritious, and delicious food to eat. May their uh, desires in terms of employment and uh, gainful and, 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 and beneficial employment be fulfilled. Whatever their wishes are in this world, such as caring for their loved ones, may all of these come about in accordance with the dharma. And may all their uh, long-term goals, and as well as the, the achievements of a lasting, stable happiness, everything that they desire, may they achieve this. We develop this mind of love, this wish, this desire for all beings to experience lasting happiness. We develop this to the point where we, from, from within us, we wish, may they achieve this. To the point where we make the commitment that I will help others achieve the causes to experience lasting happiness. This is followed by the companion mind of compassion in that wanting all beings to experience lasting stable happiness means they also need to be freed of suffering completely freed of suffering so their happiness is never interrupted by a moment of discomfort. And this then is, is how we cultivate the mind of compassion. Mm. So up to the development of love and compassion, the meditation is presented and should be practiced in the specific sequence that it is presented. However, these two meditations on love and compassion, depending on one's own individual predisposition, one can meditate first in love and then compassion, or first compassion and then love. There is no specific order or sequence to the cultivation of these two minds. ตาเนี่ยจําญีเจคอมเทวิเชลยาอันติกาจอสตาสิมจันทมจุดุงาดาสิมจันทมจุดุงาดาทาโกดุดุงาดาทาละดุงาญุดาเจบาทาโกดุ
Daddy Dewa Yuna, Daddy Dewi Gud Masa Vain, Mamba and Dewi Dewa Yaya Machina, Dewa and Dewi Guda Dengu, Dewi Guda de Garrison, Pajin Dugin Yamlin, the Chimba Sujus, or Sunday, Pajin Dugin Yamlin, the Chesa, Simjan Dewa and Demba, the Nichi, Dewi Gu Pajin Dugin Yamlin Jed, and Nipa, Tosh, you consulate Yamlin Chi. That's him, Jan, do not a draw, do not a draw the Nichi, do not a good at Jabba draw the Nichi gains, can see the Latin, Nay Consular Church, and Yamlin Jesu Gomchu, then Nyomo Pancho, and then Jimba, the children serve at the Yamlin Jawara, Malu Dinjit, the name Yamlin Jesu, Divi Gusachu, do not point a Nibuti, and the Sasang Nate of Jesu, just the same Jatam Jelang, the Nigger Lopped in Jesu, same Jatam Jew, call you Duma the Patriot in San Jesal, Quiggins, and be a summer jetty. Di lasan nam dah si boleh la. Di si dua na jana sembeda, di kita dina sembeda samlo dili kawa do paje da ngaji ngi ngaji liya tapi cecia ya sanya salo kui ngaji sembeda sem kerson tu cahsa ngaji ngi sem kelin masuana si uji jason anza lasan nam dah si boleh la. Di si ni mek samlo jam ni sembeda la barai si boleh la la barai si boleh la. The cultivation of the minds of love and compassion are specifically this wish for all beings to experience lasting stable happiness and may all beings be freed completely from pain and difficulties. So that's the cultivation of love and compassion. But these both individually need to be taken to the point, as was briefly mentioned, where one takes responsibility for the bringing of that about. And this, again, this wish of uh, this mind of our special intention or this altruistic attitude of universal responsibility, this naturally arises independence on the strength of the cultivation of the minds of love and the minds of compassion. Because when love and compassion are generated powerfully within oneself, one will want those, those, that aspiration not to be left as a mere wish but for that situation actually to come about for each and every sentient being, each and every sentient being that we know we have this close and intimate relationship with. So here we think about, so how can it beings achieve lasting happiness? This only can come about if they themselves accumulate the causes for happiness, just like with myself. How can they achieve the state freed of suffering? This can only come about if they achieve the, uh, accomplish the causes to be freed of suffering, just like myself. So here with the cultivation of the mind of, of, of um, special intention, we make the commitment to ensure that we become the most skilled of beings so that we can guide others in how they can cultivate the causes for happiness and the causes to be freed of suffering. In other words, how they can train themselves, they themselves can train in the six perfections and thereby accumulate merit and eliminate their afflictions. So this here arises within us, with this wish arises within us in the mind of um, the altruistic attitude of universal responsibility, where we make, take the commitment to free others from suffering. And how can we free others from suffering? Through guiding them based on our own knowledge and experience in a faultless manner, how, what causes to accumulate and what faults to abandon. Mm. <laughs> That Sosolia kar nibu tu dene dade mindu chesa sanje ko wa de ma to pa na ta semje ge tu ge chimbo chi tu mindu chesa sanje ko wa to pa na ta semje du du da namba ko tu ge chimbo shu chi chi tu ko tu chesa ta samje namje du ma da ko du ma le du ge du ha ya sanje ge ko wa ma to na ta mindu samje dene zang ge sanje ko wa to pa shu some be some sim sim the gear till that you sim gear was so tis a the nigga some dandel has a number of 
We mentioned um, a few segments ago that there are these two techniques for the cultivation of bodhicitta. And the, the first, the lineage of Salingpa and Atisha, is the six cause and one effect method. So here we've gone through those six causes. The first was the cultivation of the mind of, of equanimity and the understanding of the intimate relationship of, of, of mother and child we have with all beings. So that's, those two together are the first step. The second then is recollecting the kindness of all beings that have shown, they have shown us. The third is the, the resulting wish to repay that kindness. And the fourth and the fifth are the resulting minds of love and compassion. This wish that may all sentient beings, without exception, be freed of pain and suffering, the mind of compassion, and may they experience lasting, stable happiness, the mind of love. Those are the fourth and fifth. And then the sixth was the mind of a special intention, where one takes it as one's own responsibility to ensure that each being achieves a state of lasting happiness, a free, freed of suffering. And then, these are the six causes. And these causes then lead to the result, the result of bodhicitta. And this comes, uh, comes as a result of having given rise to the, this universal uh, uh, attitude of responsibility, where we have made the commitment now to work for the welfare of other beings and to do so, when, to, to achieve such a, an incredibly vast task, for, the task that relates to so many beings and so many um, activities that they need to be trained in, one has to become a Buddha because that's the only being who's skilled enough to relate to beings in the perfect way. So then one commits to becoming a Buddha for the sake of others. And that is when the result of the six causes arises, the mind of bodhicitta. And <laughs> Garzum Gorilan, the person to gain Yaman Chegi, Jehudo, Chesa, the person to gain Yaman Machena, San Yukova Tot, with the person to gain Yaman Chena, San Yukova Tot, two, the Dianzangi, person to gain Yaman de Chigi, a chigin, some chair, and Jalia, chigin, some deni, a chimpy Yaman Chiata, Sutin Yamne, Serba, Sundu, some there, two, Sin Yaman Chiare, Nikosu, Yaman Chihoresi, the Nigi Yaman Chen, and then the Tarching or do, and the San Yukova Tot to Gresi Rwada, Chesan Janju, Sim Kene, Sim Ki, Savi Chel, Lara Jedi Garelan, Passion to Win Yaman Chedida, Tima do, and Passion to Win Yaman Chedida. Then we come to the fourth major step in the meditation, now how bent bodhicitta has been generated. So how does one then fulfill this aspiration of a bodhisattva? How does one then go about becoming a Buddha oneself for the sake of others? This is then through the practice or the training in the six perfections. It's the only way that one can fulfill the aspiration that is, being, that is expressed in the mind of bodhicitta. It's only through training in the six perfections that one can become a perfected being, a Buddha. <laughs> Sanjo <laughs> Now, 
ရှိရဘဲချင်းတင်းတင်းချင်းရှိမြေတဲ့ကုနေလာချင်းရှင်လျက်ဖမ်ပတူရတာခရဲ့ချေဗေနာစံချိုကိုမကယောခရဲ့
with these various topics. And at the moment, or uh, 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 for now, if one is not the topics that one is not familiar with, then doing the meditation, one won't experience that much um, of an impact. All the impact on what, that arises in one's mind will be sporadic. Sometimes one feels something, sometimes one doesn't. But as one continues over a sustained period, one's familiarity, one's habituation to these various topics grows. And this means it becomes uh, uh, much more frequent that in our meditation we actually give rise to these minds and we can feel them arising within us, whether it's of refuge or definite emergence or bodhicitta or the minds of the various perfections. They will arise within us much more easily. They will also then start to arise within us in a more sustained way. And when during our daily activities we remind ourselves about our objects, our, our, our topics of meditation, just merely recalling our meditation of that morning will have an impact on us and will, con- and will once again bring the mind of bodhicitta manifest, or lead to the mind of bodhicitta manifestly arising within us. So this all comes about through familiarity, which is produced in engaging in these meditations repeatedly over a sustained period. And this leads to a transformation of our way of thinking. It leads to a transformation of our way of interrelating with others, or interacting with others, and dealing with problems and difficulties in our lives. So it's my hope that this meditation is something that um, you all can engage in um, every day. And then also, just recall, take a moment here and there during the day to recall your meditation. And that way, make bodhicitta manifest and ensure that this motivation of bodhicitta uh, in, in, is conjoined with all our activities, not just the um, overtly uh, 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 virtuous ones, but all our activities. Uh so over the last number of weeks, then, we have um, looked at the preliminaries to meditation. Then we looked at the trainings of, of the beings of intermediate, uh, small capacity, smallest capacity, intermediate capacity. And now we've looked at the, the trainings that are unique to the being of greatest capacity, the mind of bodhicitta. Then next week, we'll continue and we'll start, uh, we'll, we'll then return uh, more to the text, more explicitly to the text, and we'll continue with the presentation on the uh, generation of the merit field. So then, sorry, we've gone on a little bit late tonight, so we'll conclude here then. Thank you. <laughs>